Andrew, I kept you on stage. Right. Uh, we're probably going to move into a little more serious topic than Absolutely. your dancing. Uh, you know personally our next guest, Nick Ballinger. Um, you want to tell me a little about him? Sure. I had the incredible pleasure of meeting Nick uh, uh, almost uh, a little bit over two years ago. And I'm going to let Nick come out and tell his own story. Uh, but to fully understand who Nick is today it really helps uh, Rob to see uh, who he was. So at the age of 16, he was a pitcher who led his team to a state uh, championship mm -hmm. in baseball. And um, the week of his 17th birthday, he, uh, after a very severe spinal injury, he was told that he would never walk again. Uh, but the champion, and truly the champion inside him, uh, still remained, and, and lots of dedication and hard work and physical therapy. Uh, Nick actually moved from a wheelchair uh, and then slowly but surely to his feet. Uh, some of people, uh, APJ staff, met Nick when he was the recipient of the uh, MedStar NRH Gala Victory Award. And um, he is a testament to the transformative power of physical therapy. Uh, I am so delighted. He is uh, one of our sort of research partners. He's my friend and maybe a little bit too young to appreciate, but he has been uh, my teacher. And I think uh, when you meet Nick, you'll understand what a very special human being he is. Absolutely. Yeah. I am proud and pleased to bring to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Nick Ballinger. Thank you guys for the applause. You know, Dr. Guccione, I've known him for two years, and uh, I've come to learn that he is a great professor, a great physical therapist, and a great friend. And uh, for those of you who didn't know, he's also a pretty great dancer. <laughs> Get you, you got a little preview of that earlier, huh? So I'd like to start out by saying thank you to the APTA for having me here at the 2016 NEXT Conference. It's a huge honor to be asked to speak at an event like this, especially with some of my favorite people, physical therapists. Mm -hmm. Way cooler than uh, OTs, if you ask me. Anyway, I, I came here tonight to share my story and to show all of you firsthand how essential your role is to individuals like me who come to you for help. You are all miracle workers, and we as patients draw strength in so many ways from the work that you do. I am standing proof of what your hard work, passion, and inspiration can do. Talk about passion. Dr. Guccione, he's been a physical therapist for almost 40 years. And to this day, he still gets giddy like a little schoolgirl when I do a nice lateral lunge. A lateral lunge. So give it up for PTs and Dr. Guccione, guys. Nice. All right, now let's talk about something very, very important. Let's talk about me. Four years ago, I was living what almost seems like a completely different life. My high school baseball team had just won the state championship. I was heading into what promised to be one of the best summers of my life. Vacations, baseball, and friends. And I was going to be a high school senior. This was something I'd been waiting for since I was a little 13-year-old high schooler, trying to avoid those 18-year-old football players barreling down the hallway. A couple weeks after school got out, my family and I went on vacation to Maui, Hawaii. 
This was my first time back to the island since I was born there. We had a great 10-day vacation planned. We'd be there for my 17th birthday and had lots of places to visit and people to see. Day one. I woke up nice and early, around 11 o'clock. <laughs> you know those days where getting up before 12 was a major accomplishment. Actually, I'm still in those days, but anyways. We went out to this beach called Big Beach, known for their big waves, great for surfing. My dad and I went into the water while my mom and brother laid out and relaxed on the beach. I went out pretty deep. When I got far enough out, I jumped in head first. I misjudged the depth of the water, hid my head on the bottom of the ocean, and dislocated my C4, C5 vertebrae. I floated around in the water for what felt like an eternity. For the longest time, I'd have these recurring dreams of floating in the ocean, just unable to move, unable to breathe, just sort of getting pushed back and forth by the waves. Something I remember pretty vividly. What felt like an eternity was actually only a few seconds, as my dad quickly swam towards me, noticing something was wrong. He dragged me onto dry land and saved my life. The next day, I woke up in the hospital with a metal halo screwed into my skull, wondering what was going on. This was the exact hospital where I had been born 17 years earlier and where I would spend my 17th birthday later that week. I don't remember much about the next week or so. I was mostly just floating in and out of consciousness due to all the surgeries and pain medication. I was later told that they put some dead guy's bone in my neck, which I thought was a little weird, but kind of cool. <laughs> it actually took me a while to grasp the severity of my injury. I remember lying in the hospital bed a few days after my accident and asking the doctor if I'd be able to make our tea time later that week. He said, probably not. What a jerk. <laughs> Honestly, I don't ever remember anyone even saying the word paralyzed to me. In my head, this was all just a shock to the system, and I'd quickly be back on my feet. Then the harsh reality hit. After about two weeks, I'd still been unable to move or feel anything. This was no sprained ankle, I thought to myself. One day, I called the doctor in, just me and him, and I said, Doc, no BS. When will I be walking again? Of course, you guys know doctors. He gave me some vague, non-committal answer, something about how the chances were extremely low for someone with my injury, but no injury's the same, and you never know. All I heard was, you'll never walk again. For about three weeks, I was in the ICU of the Maui Memorial Hospital, unable to move anything below my neck other than my biceps. So about all I could do was punch myself in the face, which happens more than you would think. <laughs> It's funny because I knew what paralysis was before I, got, before I got injured. I knew it meant you couldn't move your arms or maybe your legs, but I never really thought of how that experience might affect someone, as I'm sure most people haven't. It's particularly difficult to, uh, to explain the emotions I was experiencing. Confusion, fear, anger, and sadness come to mind looking back at it now. I had my life turned upside down. I loved playing sports, being outside, hanging out with friends, and now all those things seem so distant. I had hopes of playing baseball in college, traveling the world, going to concerts, experiencing things that were, in my head, no longer possible. Until one day, I moved my leg. I moved my freaking leg. <laughs> By the way, that's the, uh, actually the PG version of what I wanted to say in my speech. <laughs> 
For weeks I laid in my hospital bed just trying and trying all day just to get any sort of signal down to my legs. When I finally broke through, I remember calling my mom in to show her. I said, look at my leg. She looked. I moved it again. She was like, honey, I, what are you talking about? I don't see anything. That's my impersonation of my mom. <laughs> so, so then I said, look closer, woman. <laughs> this, is, this is a big deal. And she saw it. She noticed that little twitch of my leg I'd been so excited about. It might have only been a fraction of an inch, but that was all I needed. I knew I would take that fraction of an inch, turn it into two inches, then six inches, and before long, a whole step. I realized then that the time for feeling sorry for myself was over. It was time to put in work. It was time to forget about what I had lost and to look forward to what I had to gain. This is something that I learned is so important in life and can really translate to so many situations. Don't dwell on what you can't do or what you no longer have because that's just wasted energy. Have you ever heard the phrase, when one door opens, another one closes? Or, <laughs> sorry, when one door closes, another one opens. <laughs> Mess that up. Oh. Well, the way I see it is that having loss in your life creates a hole. However, I believe that this only presents an opportunity. An opportunity to fill that hole with something or even someone that will make you happy. It's not going to feel the same or even look the same. But trust me, it's much better than tripping and falling into that hole. If you accept that transition and work hard at it, your life will be much more fulfilling. For example, I lost the sport that I love to play since I was seven years old, but I gained the ability to share my story through opportunities like this. Okay, back to the story. <laughs> three weeks, after three weeks in Hawaii, I flew to the National Rehab Hospital in Washington, D.C. Early on in my stay at NRH, I realized that I did not like wheelchairs one bit. Actually, my power chair was kind of cool. I could adjust the speed and whip that thing around the hallways, you know? Which I got in trouble for. <laughs> Nevertheless, I had to do everything in my power to get back on my feet, and I knew that it would take every bit of strength, resilience, and courage that I possessed in order to do so. I was a man on a mission. If my therapist said do 10 reps, I'd say why not 12? If any of my therapists showed up five minutes late, you know who you are. <laughs> I remember you. <laughs> I made sure I got those extra five minutes at the end of the session. I worked to the point of exhaustion every day, often throwing up multiple times per session. Although that might have been due to the hospital food. Nothing like cheeseburgers and pizza for three months, huh? I count my blessings every day that I had such amazing physical therapists, Lauren Russell and Katie Seward. They pushed me, made me laugh, made me throw up, <laughs> and made me believe. They did so much for me. For example, Katie knew I loved baseball, so after PT sessions, we'd play catch in the parallel bars. Lauren was the first person that told me I'd be able to walk again. I'll never forget that feeling. I think I smiled for three days straight after that. <laughs> Both of them even attended my high school graduation where I walked across the stage only 10 months after my injury. Thank you. It was people like them and people like all of you that make all the difference in our recovery. When I left the hospital, I continued my regimen of working out every day. 
whether it be in outpatient rehab, having trainers come to my house, walking around the neighborhood, or just exercising with my parents or brother. I made sure I was doing everything I could to beat the odds and get back on my feet. Slowly but surely, I got stronger. I went from a power chair to a push wheelchair to a walker to two crutches, and now only one crutch. And eventually, I'm sure my parents will hide this somewhere, forcing me to get around on my own. They're cruel. They're cruel people. <laughs> now, I spoke earlier about strength. Although I'd like to take credit for my strength in the face of this adversity, the truth is I've drawn heavily on the strength of many people in my life. First and foremost, my strength can mostly be attributed to my family. My parents possess superhuman strength and love. Throughout my journey, I have constantly found myself fueled by their strength when I had nothing left in my tank. They stuck with me through every step of my journey, at certain times whether I wanted them there or not. My brother and my aunts have also been an extremely supportive and encouraging influence. My brother Alex is even here tonight. There he is. I don't know why anybody's not sitting next to him. You must smell or something. I don't know. <laughs> but honestly, oh, there we go. Yeah, keep him company. Thank you, thank you. Don't worry, Alex, it's almost over. We'll go, uh, we'll go get some food after. <sighs> Along with my family, I've been blessed with great friends throughout my life, as well as a very supportive community. Mentioning all these people brings me to another lesson I've learned in my journey. It's important to surround yourself with support with positive people, physical therapists and doctors included, that you can depend on and lean on when times are tough. Nobody can or should have to go through a struggle like mine without being able to lean on others. Draw strength from those around you, and you are sure to be better because of it. These are the people that will help you get out of that hole and fill it up for good. So now what? For the past two years, I've been participating in the Rehab Science Overground Locomotion Training Study at George Mason University. It's a mouthful. This program is run by this guy over here, Dr. Guccione. I was actually their first participant. They still haven't been able to get rid of me. <laughs> there are now eight participants, and the program continues to grow. In this program, the PhD students, led by Jared Golly and Gino Panza, they put participants through exercise programs twice a week. By the way, remember those names, Jared Golly and Gino Panza and the Patriot Performance Project. I have a feeling you'll be hearing a lot about them one day. Anyway, after 24 sessions, we conduct multiple gait analysis and oxygen input-output tests to record and analyze the progress being made. So far, I've completed seven rotations, and we continue to see progress each time. No, I keep saying we because after two years, at this point, I'm basically a PhD student. <laughs> at least I consider myself one. Maybe I'll get an honorary degree or something, huh? What do you think, Doc? Sure? All right, sure. You know, the first time I met them, I was in a wheelchair. And now I'm not. Simple as that. So although the words they use to describe my progress might be too big and scientific for me to understand, I think it might be working. Right, Doc? It's working? It's working? Okay. I got to check with him on these things. He's a boss. <laughs> this summer, I'm working as an intern at the United States Department of State in Washington, DC. 
So thank you to my boss for letting me have this week off. <laughs> Much appreciated. Also, I'll be a senior at George Mason University this fall, and I finally turned 21 at the end of July. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. This whole journey has been a huge mix of emotions. Looking back at it now, the greatest irony of this whole experience is that it took losing everything I thought I had to discover so much of who I really am. I've discovered that not just me, but everyone is so much stronger than we think we are. The only frustrating part is that it often takes such extreme adversity to bring out these characteristics of ourselves that represent our true strength. What I'm trying to say is, if you really want to reach your full potential, to realize your full strength, you have to challenge yourself. Dig yourself out of that hole, fill it up, and walk right over that damn thing. And if you can't, find a good PT and walk over it together. Thank you. Way to go. Went pretty well. Home run. Give me a hug, man. Yeah. Hug. Nice. Wow. Thank you, Nick. Thank um, you. That was pretty inspirational. Your story is incredible. Um, we actually have a clip. I want you to tee it up. Um, baseball's, you're not done with baseball. I hope not. Right. Um, you're still doing some pitching. Yeah, we, we uh, practice throwing every once in a while. I got two new dogs. I'm trying to teach them how to play fetch. So I've right. got to practice my throwing every once in a while. I'm fairly certain you can strike out Andrew <laughs> with your pitches. Do we have a clip of, of Nick pitching? I think we have a clip we can, we can look at. Nick, you, you truly are an inspiration, and, and you. this audience, uh, they love you. <laughs> uh, your story is absolutely incredible.